payment surplus and you are projected to keep recording a balance of payment surplus for the foreseeable future, you are recording a fiscal surplus and you are projected to keep recording a, a fiscal surplus for the foreseeable future, it means you are not in trouble. It means you do not need an IMF bailout loan. It means you don't need to be bailed out. You do not need to be bailed out. So that is why we are saying that when you look at the decision by President Hakainde Ichirema to put Zambia on an IMF bailout loan, that decision was made even before he put together his cabinet. A decision like that needed wide consultation. The president needed to have first put in place his cabinet and that decision should have come as a proposal from the Minister of Finance tabled to cabinet and cabinet is able to deliberate on it and then you take it out to key stakeholders in the nation. You convene stakeholder meetings with trade associations such as the Zambia Association of Manufacturers, such as the Zambia Association of Chambers of Commerce and Industry, Zaki, such as the Bankers Association of Zambia, you know, professional associations such as the Zambia Institute of Chartered Accountants, the Law Association of Zambia, the Bankers Institute of Zambia. You convene them and you hear their submissions. What are their views? What are the views of these independent bodies regarding the country's decision to go the IMF route, to go and get an IMF bailout packet? What are their uh, submissions? And then after you've consulted widely, that is when the president would have sat and announced to say, we as a government have decided to get an IMF bailout loan. You cannot have a situation like what happened, whereby the president is inaugurated, and two days later, without cabinet in place, without any consultation with anybody, he announces that we are going to get an IMF bailout loan. You can't have such a situation unless there are certain hidden motives. Unless there are certain hidden motives. So our expectation is that for something as critical as getting an IMF loan, because when you talk about an IMF loan, it comes with a lot of conditions which affect all the people of this country. It is not like any other loan, like maybe a loan from China, where they give you the money and they don't care how you use the money, they just want their money to be paid back. When you get an IMF loan, you need to comply with certain, certain conditions. And those conditions include an employment freeze. We've already seen an instruction from Secretary to Cabinet that no one should be hired in the civil service. That is an employment freeze. You've got a wage freeze where people's salaries are frozen maybe for a period of up to five years. You've got issues such as increasing electricity tariffs. We've heard the president hint to that. You are talking about issues such as increase in the, uh, uh, fuel prices. We've heard the president hint to that. So all those are things which will directly affect Zambians, wherever they are. Whichever corner of the country they are, it will directly affect them. And the expectation is that for a properly run government, before you make a decision which is going to directly affect each and every citizen, you need to consult widely. You might still come back to the same decision, but you need to consult widely. You need to listen to what other people have to say about your proposed decision which is going to affect the majority of Zambians. And our submission today is that President Hakainde Ichirema failed to consult widely. He even failed to consult from his own cabinet. Because by the time he announced that he's going to go the IMF route, his cabinet was not even constituted yet. And in that regard, on that basis, we wish to appeal to the president, as we hereby do, to consider suspending any further talks with regard to contracting the IMF loan. We are appealing to the president to restart the process if he still wishes to contract the IMF loan. And restarting that process should begin with the engaging key stakeholders. When you are president of a nation, 
Yes, you are the number one citizen in terms of decision making, but you need to consult other citizens as well. So we are appealing to the president to restart the process of contracting the IMF loan, and he needs to restart it by consulting widely, consulting the various key stakeholders in this country, including the church and traditional leaders. That is our submission on the issue of the International Monetary Fund. We go to the fifth item under the banner of checks and balances, which is the breakdown in the rule of law due to undermining of the Zambia police. Breakdown in the rule of law due to undermining of the Zambia police service by the government. Ladies and gentlemen of the media, citizens, a right that was issued by the Honorable Minister of Home Affairs about two weeks ago now, whereby he instructed the police to suspend all checkpoints and all roadblocks except for a few uh, checkpoints when you are entering major cities. And first of all, the source of our disappointment, before we come to the substance, is the manner in which this announcement was made. We all know that in order to maintain law and order, there is need for citizens to respect the police. And the police cannot be respected if a senior government minister is seen undermining them. The Honorable Minister of Home Affairs used a lot of disparaging language when announcing his decision. He said he's not going to tolerate a situation whereby when the police are blocked, they go and mount a roadblock to make money for themselves. We are all aware and we are all agreeable that there are certain pockets of corruption within the Zambia Police Service, just like any big organization. When you go uh, to any big organization, including the church, you find that there are certain few corrupt individuals within that organization. That is what makes up society. Some are faithful, some have integrity, others don't. So for the Minister of Finance to undermine the entire Zambia Police Service simply because of a few elements within the Zambia Police Service was totally unacceptable. Even if the minister wanted to announce any decision regarding uh, roadblocks, he was supposed to engage the Zambia Police Service Command and agree with them, and that announcement was supposed to come from the Zambia Police Service itself, as opposed to the decision to suspend checkpoints and roadblocks coming from a minister in the middle of disparaging language against the police. The total effect of that statement from Honorable Jack Mimbo, ladies and gentlemen, is that the authority of the Zambia Police Service, the authority of each and every man and woman in uniform has been significantly undermined. Whenever a police officer is even attending to a road traffic accident by the side of a road, when people are passing in buses, they will be shouting and insulting that police officer, saying that very kanyefio, fish ureshta yo, fumapo. You understand? Why? Because the Honorable Minister of Home Affairs, instead of building the respect and integrity towards the Zambia Police Service, decided to undermine the Zambia Police Service in general and the men and women in uniform in particular. You do not govern a country like that. You do not govern a country like that. If you are going to properly govern a country, you need to respect the people in whom you've bestowed authority. And in our case, it is the Zambia Police Service. Now, coming to the substance of the decision to suspend those checkpoints and roadblocks, our view is that the minister should have worked hand in hand with the Zambia Police Service to ensure that these checkpoints and roadblocks are done in a manner that reduces congestion on the road. Because the biggest issue that motorists have is the congestion which is caused whenever a road checkpoint or roadblock is mounted. 
So if they can come up with mechanisms to reduce road congestion, then the checkpoints are necessary. They need to be there. Because if you do not have checkpoints, if the police are not checking the roads which are moving on the road, then all sorts of vehicles will be moving on the road. That is number one. Road, uh, 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 vehicles which are not roadworthy, vehicles which are causing road traffic accidents. Already we are aware of nine people who died about two days ago, uh, near six miles there, when a tipper truck lost control and went to hit into a Rosa bus. And uh, we were just reading some reports to say um, that vehicle, uh, uh, after being examined, did not have, was not roadworthy. We are not aware of exactly what was, what made it unroadworthy, but we are told it wasn't roadworthy. So chances are that it might not have the appropriate brakes or anything to that effect. And if that person had been able to pass through a checkpoint, those things might have been identified and addressed. The bottom line, ladies and gentlemen, is that we need the law and order. We need the traffic checkpoints. Only that they need to be done in a sober manner, which ensures that there is no congestion on the road, and which is done in a manner whereby there is no corruption involved by the police uh, when mounting those checkpoints. But the checkpoints need to be there. There is no question about it. So that is our submission on the issue of the breakdown in the rule of law due to the UPND administration's undermining of the Zambia Police Service through the Minister of Home Affairs. Ladies and gentlemen of the media, allow me to go to the 60th item under the banner of checks and balances, which is the unreasonable enforcement of a 20% withholding tax on betting winnings, online betting winnings. We find this extremely regrettable. We find this extremely disappointing because when you look at the concept of taxation, when you look at the entire concept of tax, tax is supposed to be fair and equitable. It is supposed to be fair and equitable. Wherever you go in the world, that is the underlying principle of taxation. It must be fair and equitable. Now, ladies and gentlemen of the media, tell me what is fair and equitable about this young person or this elderly person who buys an online ticket and loses. He buys another online ticket and loses. He buys 10 online tickets and loses, spending 1,000 kwacha. And then on the 11th online ticket that he buys, he wins a 200 kwacha. So on that particular day, he has spent a thousand kwacha and he has gained 200 kwacha. And then on that 200 kwacha which he has won, the government wants to get 40 kwacha. How fair and how equitable is that? The answer to that is that it is not fair and it is not equitable. It is not fair and it is not equitable because taxation is supposed to be based on the gains that someone makes, and not the losses. That is why even a company, including the big companies, the mines, before you tax the mine, they'll look at how much money they've generated by sales, and then they will deduct the expenses they've incurred, the salaries, the buying fuel, the this and that, they'll deduct all that from the sales. And whatever remains, if it is positive, that is what the government taxes. What remains? The positive surplus that remains. So if the government is that fair and equitable to big corporations like the mines, then why should they tax an individual whereby they don't care how much the individual has put in in terms of buying tickets, they just want to tax whatever amount the individual wins, even if the net position of the individual is a deficit, it is a minus. That is number one. Because when you look at it from a fairness point of view, even employees who are in former employment, we are all aware that every month they are given 4,000 kwacha tax-free, isn't it? 4,000 kwacha tax-free, people who are employed. Now, a person who is unemployed, 
who goes to do online betting and wins 500 kwacha. The only 500 kwacha that that person has won in that month, he's being taxed how much on it? 100 kwacha. Meanwhile, the person who is in formal employment, the government gives him a free way up to... The answer is that it is grossly unfair. Also, when you look at it from a compliance point of view, at the moment, gambling is being done legally. You can see a lot of online gam uh, gambling shops around, isn't it? It is being done legally, which means the Zambia Revenue Authority and the government, the government through ZRA is able to collect money from those companies because it is legal. You understand? What will happen is that if government continues with this unreasonable tax, whereby they are taxing the owners of the companies and also taxing those who win, what will happen is that gambling in this country will go underground. It will not be seen, which means government will not be able to correct any single way because people will be doing gambling secretly. So what is the benefit of that, even to the government itself? There's no benefit. The argument that this law was enacted under the previous administration doesn't hold water. Because the previous administration enacted this law in 2014, but suspended its implementation pending further consultation and possible amendment. The current UPND administration came on board and without consulting anybody, decided to just go ahead and implement a law that has been suspended for almost five years. If we were dealing with a competent government, the first thing you do is to ask and say, why has this law not been implemented all these years? So that you can benefit from the advice you are given as to the reasons why the law has not been implemented. If President Hakainde Ichirema and his cabinet had done that consultation, he would have been advised accordingly and he would have avoided this unreasonable 20% tax. He would have avoided this unreasonable 20% tax. Which comes back to our earlier argument about the need for wider consultation before you make any critical decision as a government. You need to consult. You should never assume that you have a monopoly of knowledge and wisdom. Nobody has a monopoly of knowledge and wisdom. No matter how internally intelligent you feel, you do not have a monopoly of knowledge and wisdom. Hence the need to consult widely every time before you make an important national decision. Ladies and gentlemen of the media, our appeal to the UPND administration in general and President Hakainde Ichirema in particular is that they should suspend the 20% withholding tax on betting winnings immediately, pending further consultation. They should suspend it immediately because it is grossly unfair to the unemployed people who win 500 kwacha, which is the only winning in a month, and yet the government wants to get 100 kwacha of that. And yet employees who are in the formal sector go away with up to 4,000 kwacha tax free. We are all equal as citizens before the law, before the government. And each one of us must be treated fairly and equitably without any favoritism. So far, President Haka Hidechirema is punishing the unemployed instead of giving them employment or at the most ignoring them. He's going after them and punishing them, which is totally unacceptable. Ladies and gentlemen of the media, allow me to go to item number seven under the banner of checks and balances. This is an item regarding the excuses that are being given regarding the promised sale of the presidential date. Ladies and gentlemen of the media, if you remember our argument when we were still under the previous administration regarding this presidential jet, our argument was that this jet was too expensive. We were not saying that the president does not deserve a jet. The president deserves a jet so that he can move conveniently 
from one place to another without using a commercial airline. But such a jet should be reasonably priced. When you look at this Gulf Stream G650 private jet, it costs in excess of $160 million. And our argument is that when, for example, you look at the president of Botswana, Mr. Masisi, he recently bought a private jet, an ATR-42, which is a bigger in size compared to the Gulf Stream. And he bought it for about $15 million. It is a brand new jet. It is reliable. He uses it to travel wherever he wants to go across the world. So President Akai Nechirema needs a jet, no question about it, but he doesn't need a top of the range jet like a Gulf Stream, which is more than 10 times the price of an average acceptable jet, like an ATR. So that is our submission. So our appeal on this particular matter to President Hakai Ndeichirema is that he should stop giving excuses when it comes to selling this jet. Excuses such as we'll table this matter before cabinet, we'll table this matter before parliament. We all know that President Ndeichirema controls cabinet. We all know that President Ichirema controls parliament through his members of parliament. So President Ichirema should not hide behind these uh, institutions such as cabinet or parliament and say we'll table the matter there and we'll hear what they decide. He's being untruthful to the Zambian people. He's being untruthful to the Zambian people. And we want a honest president, not a president who believes that he can play with the minds of the Zambian people by appearing to distance himself from the decision such that when cabinet uh, decides to say, no, keep the jet, Mr. President, uh, or parliament votes to say, keep the jet, Mr. President, then HH comes back and say, look, me, I didn't have anything to do with it. It was cabinet. Look, I didn't have anything to do with it. It was parliament. We don't want such a dishonest president. We want someone who can take responsibility. And the decision to sell the jet is for the president to make, not cabinet, not parliament. We want to make it very clear. And in this regard, we are appealing to President Hakai Ndeichirema to sell the Gulf Stream private jet immediately and proceed to acquire for himself another private jet which is reasonably priced. If he is not sure about what jet to use, he can pick up a phone call, a phone and make a call to his counterpart in Botswana. President Masisi, and uh, he can have a look at the jet that President Masisi uses to fly around before the supporters of the president come and say, no, a president can't use a cheaper plane. There are other presidents in the region, including the Angolan president, if I'm not mistaken. They all fly using an ATR-42. So we want the president to sell the expensive private jet, buy a more reasonably priced jet so that he doesn't use commercial but he is flying in a reasonably priced jet. That is what we want. That is our appeal to the president. And we also appeal to the president to stop hiding behind cabinet or parliament. It's his decision to make. Ladies and gentlemen of the media, allow me to go to item number eight under the banner of checks and balances, which is the failure to deliver farming inputs on time. <coughs> Failure to deliver farming inputs on time. We all know that agriculture is a major employer in this country. We all know that. We all know that our relatives in the villages, they are far flung. Shangongo, Kaputa, Vubui, they rely on agriculture as a source of income. When they farm, they sell to FRA, they get some money. So that even that trousers which was torn during the year, they can take it to the tailor now and patch it. That is their only source of income. Most of us here have a monthly income. Every month end, an SMS comes to our phone, your account has been credited. The people out there, the majority of Zambians, don't have any such privilege as we do here. They rely on farming. So if you have a reasonable government, they need to attach the appropriate level of importance to an activity such as farming. And so far, this is October, the farming inputs should have started being distributed already, but we haven't seen anything on the ground yet. 
We haven't seen anything on the ground yet. And we want to remind the UPND administration in general and President Hakainde Ichirema in particular, in case they've been sleeping, to wake up from their slumber and ensure that farming inputs are distributed immediately. Otherwise, he is only going to be further increasing the levels of poverty in this country because the majority of our people are not in formal employment. They rely on subsistence farming as a source of income. So their only source of income must be respected. And the only way to respect the only source of income for the majority of our Zambian citizens is to deliver farming inputs on time. The president should not have any excuses that he has only been in office for one and a half months. There are certain things which you prioritize. Certain things you prioritize. Certain things that cannot wait for you to settle in six months or one year or whatever time the president wants for him to be considered settled in. There are certain things that require immediate attention. And supply of farming inputs is one such thing. So that is our appeal to the government. Ladies and gentlemen of the media, allow me to go to the ninth item under the banner of checks and balances, which is appointment of incompetent cabinet ministers. These include the ministers of information and broadcasting, the minister of mining, the minister of tourism, the minister of sports, the minister of local government, as well as the minister of home affairs. We'll go into the details why we've made the conclusion that these people are incompetent and not suitable for the positions that they occupy. We'll start with the Minister of Information. The Minister of Information. Actually, you know, our observation is that so far, each and every UPND administration minister, the first time that they open their mouth, it is usually a disaster. They say a lot of wrong things. We don't know whether they didn't go through the necessary orientation. We are not sure. When you look at the Minister of Information, who represents government, and you look at her first press briefing, he dedicated about 70% of the entire press briefing to an individual, to an individual, Mr. Lafleur Nakachinda. How do you as government dedicate your entire 70% of your press briefing to an individual? You are, as a government, you are supposed to be looking at the bigger picture, the nation, not trying to uh, uh, address individuals in the, a national address. So on that basis, we made the conclusion that the Minister of Information is the wrong person for the job. And the area that uh, President Akayende Ichirema replaces him, the better. And when he does that, he will be doing himself a favor. When we look at the Minister of Mining, we feel disappointed for a number of reasons, particularly how he handled the issue of KCM and Mopani. Instead of, we are all aware of the relationship which will manage this critical issue if you begin to point fingers and disparage other people, especially a person as important as it, the liquidator, someone who has been running the affairs of a mine for more than two years. You need to sit down with them. You need to work with them. Even if the person committed a crime, Obviously, that crime is not murder. They committed a crime. If they committed a crime, that's fine. Work with them first. Try to resolve the bigger issue, which will affect the entire nation. After you resolve that issue now, you can then go back to that person and say, uh, Buona Liquidator, there is this uh, criminal offense that was uh, committed. But you cannot start by harassing the critical person who is needed for you to resolve the KCM issue. You start dragging them to court. That is not thinking properly. That is it, not thinking properly. He was supposed to put the interest of the nation first before the individual interest of trying to um, apprehend and arrest that particular individual. At the end of the day, as a leader, you always face conflicting decisions. You find that you need to make this decision, you also need to make that decision. And as a leader, you need to weigh between the two. 
which one is the bigger picture here. And saving the mine, saving KCM is more critical than prosecuting the liquidator, Mr. Miringo. Even if we prosecute the liquidator, Mr. Miringo, and we send him to prison, then tomorrow KCM wins the case, or rather Vedanta wins the case against Zambia, and we need to compensate Vedanta billions of dollars for managing, for grabbing the mine away from them. How does that benefit us? How does putting Mr. Miringo into prison benefit the nation when we have lost the mine? It doesn't. So that is why for us, we appealed to the UPND administration from the very beginning, and President Haga in Chilema, from the very beginning to say, look, in the management of national affairs, with this mandate, this overwhelming mandate which the Zambian people have given you, put emotions aside, put emotions aside, always put the national interest first. When you do that, you always make decisions which will benefit the common Zambian, as opposed to you putting your personal uh, emotions ahead of what is in the interest of the nation at large. So we are disappointed with the Minister of Mines uh, regarding that handling of that matter, and in our view, he does not deserve to be in that position. Minister of Tourism, Mr. Uh, Skalinda. We were very disappointed with him because of the statement that he made that uh, Livingstone and the hotels in Livingstone, the only people that should work there, that will be allowed to work there, are people from within Livingstone. People from within Livingstone are the only ones who will be allowed to work in hotels in Livingstone. And his justification was that he is trying to empower the local people. But what about the other Zambians who come from the other parts of the country? The moment a government, a senior government official starts thinking like that, then you know that the country is not in safe hands. Because that is the starting point of dividing the country. Can you imagine a situation where someone comes from Kaputa in Lapula, and uh, uh, they sent their children to Fairview, they did their training in hospitality and hotel industry, the person gets a job in Livingstone, and the moment they go to report after the parents celebrate that their daughter has finally gotten a job, the person, the, the daughter goes to report in Livingstone, and they are sent back that they cannot work in Livingstone because they don't come from Livingstone. They don't come from Livingstone. They are not an indigenous person from within Livingstone. How would do that parent in Kaputa Look at their neighbor, their neighbor who comes from Livingston. Would they uh, welcome their neighbor? They wouldn't. The same applies to anyone from any other part of Zambia. So the moment you start dividing the nation and start saying that no, only people from this area will work in that area. Next thing, the Lambas who are the owners of Copper Belt will say no other tribe should work in the mines. And then you are splitting the country. So we demanded for the minister to retract his statement and issue an apology to the nation regarding this matter, and so far he has not. And uh, we are in the process of approaching the court to declare the minister's statement unconstitutional. We are going to file a lawsuit in this regard, either this week or next week. Coming to the Minister of Sports, ladies and gentlemen, we are all aware that uh, our national team has not been performing well for some time now. And uh, with the change of government, we were hopeful that the new government will find a way of revitalizing our sports. And so we were disappointed when the first statement that uh, uh, the Minister of Sports made was that uh, the current Kamanga administration should involve uh, Karusha Waria in the administration of FAS. We all know of the rivalry which has been there between the Kamanga camp and the Karusha, uh, Karusha Waria camp. And for a government, you are supposed to be a neutral arbitrator. You are not supposed to appear to undermine anybody. The moment you start making statements like the Kamanga administration should involve Karusha Waria in the management of FAS, you are essentially saying that Kamanga has failed to manage FAS on his own and therefore Kalusha needs to come and manage first with Kamanga. And the moment you do that, you are creating conflict. 
Even if that is what is happening on the ground, you are supposed to do it privately. You are supposed to call uh, the first president, Mr. Kamanga, you sit him on the table. You call uh, Mr. Karushawaria, you sit on the table, just the three of you and yourself as minister. And you talk about ways we can improve our football. You should not do things for the public gallery. The UPND administration should desist from doing things for the public gallery. If they really want to resolve problems, they need to resolve problems behind closed doors and only announce to us the results of that resolution. So that is our issue with the Minister of Sports. The Minister of Local Government, of course, his view that cadres need to be brought back is a disappointment together with the Minister of Home Affairs. And therefore, uh, we don't have confidence in those two as well. Ladies and gentlemen, allow me to go to item number 10 on the issue of checks and balances, which is the failure to control cadalism. We have seen that despite the nice words coming from the president, cadalism has still continued in a lot of markets. There are still a lot of markets which are under the control of UPND cadres. People are still being attacked. And for the first time, we saw a police officer being assaulted in Kamwara by UPND cadres. Even under the PF administration, where cadalism was very, very high, where even ourselves we were attacked in Cairo Road, we did not see a police officer being hacked with a panga. Even when those cadres went to Central Police and harassed the police officers at Central Police, we did not see a police officer being hacked in the head with a panga. That only happened under the leadership of President Haka in the Ichirema. A police officer was hacked in the head in uniform with a panga by a UPND cadre. And you know what the worst part of it was? The worst part of it was that the president did not condemn that. He did not publicly condemn that. We remember that under the PF, when a cadre incident like that happened, there was some condemnation that came. Although we all know that that condemnation was not genuine. But even fake condemnation is better than total silence. So the least that President Dagai and Dejirema would have done after a police officer in uniform was hacked by a UPND cadre in Kamara was to condemn that incident. Even if he doesn't mean it with all his heart, he should have condemned it. So on that basis, we are extremely disappointed regarding the failure by President Dejirema to address the issue of cadalism in this country. Ladies and gentlemen of the media, allow me to go to item number 11 under the heading of checks and balances, which is the refusal by the president to declare his assets. We have seen that the president has perfected the art of denying responsibility. Denying responsibility. He has done it on the president, uh, presidential jet and He's doing it on the declaration of assets. He's running away from responsibility and giving it to ECZ and saying, me, I declare it to ECZ. But that declaration is yours. So in the interest of transparency, in the interest of accountability, if we are demanding that you declare assets, your assets, because you are a president now, you are a public officer, you shouldn't come up with other counter arguments and start saying, no, what about the other candidates? No. What about President Rungu? No. What about that one? Stop giving excuses. Just declare your assets. If you have nothing to hide, declare your assets. It is your assets. Even the declaration that you gave to ECZ, it is you who prepared it. So if people are demanding that you declare your assets, why not just share your declaration with the media and say, those are my assets and liabilities? Why should it take us to go to court? As we speak right now, we are in the Constitutional Court trying to compel the president to declare his assets. So it shows that the president is not as transparent, he's not as accountable as he, as he portrays himself to be. It seems that he came to the leadership of this nation with a particular agenda, which we don't know about. And it is incumbent upon people like yourselves as the media and people like ourselves as the opposition to hold the president accountable. 
to hold the president accountable. If we don't do that, then the president's hidden agenda of running the country will come to fruition at the expense of the nation at large. We don't know what that agenda is. Ladies and gentlemen of the media, allow me to go to the second last item, which is the twelfth item under the banner of checks and balances. And this is failure to provide policy direction on Mopani and KCM matters. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, as we opened our press briefing at the beginning, we spoke about the balance of payment position, where we look at exports versus imports, and how that feeds into the exchange rate, how that feeds into the entire health of the economy. And we emphasize that our major export is minerals, copper in particular, and cobalt, isn't it? And some of the major mining companies are Mopani and KCM. And when you look at these two mines, they are issues which require to be resolved. When you look at Mopani, President Dakaende Ichirema, when he was in opposition, was against the decision by government to buy out uh, Grenko and acquire Mopani under that loan arrangement. They were against that. They were very much against that. Now that they are in government, everybody in the mining sector is waiting for their pronouncement on the issue of Mopani. They are waiting for their pronouncement to say, since you, President Ichirema, you were against this uh, purchase of Mopani by government, now that you are the president, are you going to reverse this decision or you are going to continue with it? Without the government pronouncing its position on that matter, there is uncertainty in the mining industry. Because people don't know. They don't know whether the UPND administration is in support of the decision that the PF administration made to acquire uh, Mopani from uh, Grenko, or they are not in support, whether they will reverse it. And for as long as there is uncertainty, people cannot invest in an industry where there is uncertainty. So we want the president to pronounce himself on this matter and say, oh, me, since I'm president now, I think we'll go this direction. We'll uh, continue with the decision that was made by the previous administration and we'll keep Mopani. Or no, me, I'll reverse. Whichever direction, we need the proper policy direction from President Ichiro. Coming to the issue of KCM, we are all aware about the ongoing legal battles that are in court between government and uh, the Danta. And uh, uh, we... We, we are all aware of the position that President Ichirema held when he was in the opposition. He was against the liquidation, the liquidation of KCM. And now that he's president, what is his position? Is he still against the liquidation of KCM, in which case he's going to withdraw that case from court? Or he's now changed his mind, he's now going to be in support of the liquidation? He needs to provide guidance. Without providing that guidance, the entire mining industry is in disarray. And for as long as the mining industry is in disarray, there can be no investment there. Even our productivity is undermined. So our demand, this one is not a request, because it's an important national issue, very critical. Our demand to the president is that he needs to pronounce himself on these two issues, Mopani and Kesia. He should not keep quiet on this matter. He is keeping quiet is a sign of indecision. And we want a decided president if this country's economy is going to be turned around. Ladies and gentlemen of the media, allow me to address the 13th and last item under the heading of checks and balances to the UPND administration, which is the haphazard approach in the fight against COVID-19. Haphazard approach by the UPND administration in the fight against COVID-19. We are all aware that the third wave of COVID killed a lot of people. I'm sure each one of us has a relative or friend who died during the third wave. And we are all aware that after the third wave, the demand for vaccines has been very high. It has been very high. Whenever a batch of whether AstraZeneca or any other vaccine comes, the queues are long, long and tedious. And so we have always appealed, not only to the UPND administration, but also to the PF administration before, that what we need to do as a nation is increase the vaccination level. Currently, 
we've got less than 3% of our total population being vaccinated. And the only way we can achieve higher levels of vaccination is by procuring vaccines on the world market. And a dosage of vaccine is less than $4. Less than $4. And yet the cost of treating a critically ill COVID-19 patient is in excess of $20,000. So it is cheaper and economical for the government to procure vaccines and prevent critical illness when the fourth wave comes, as and when it does. But we have seen that uh, about two days ago, President Hichirema was launching a promotion on people getting vaccines at uh, one of his presses here. And uh, he was doing that despite not procuring big enough quantities of the vaccines. We all saw that in the previous vaccinations, the vaccine runs out when there is still long queues, which means the demand for the vaccine is there. And when the demand is there, what is the point of engaging in further promotion of the vaccine when the demand is already there, when what is lacking is the vaccine? We expected the president to procure the vaccine and make sure it is widely distributed, not only in Lusaka, because so far, most of the vaccination is taking place in Osaka. So we expected the president to buy, to buy at least maybe a million doses, not that 100,000 that is donated by World Health Organization. That doesn't go anywhere. Just within a day or two, it is finished. So we expected the president to announce to the nation the procurement of, say, 1 million or 2 million or 3 million doses of the vaccines distributed to all corners of Zambia. Distributed to all corners of Zambia. If and when a situation comes whereby people are not going to get vaccinated, then the president can now say, no, let us promote the vaccine. But where there are long queues already, and you as a president, you are wasting time promoting a vaccine which already has demand, but there is no supply, then clearly, to us, that is a demonstration of uncoordinated management of national affairs, which is totally regrettable. We expected that with the coming of the UPND government, the quality of management of government affairs would improve. But unfortunately, we are not seeing much of that. Even basic, basic decisions are not being made. They are not being made. There is a lot of laissez-faire approach from government, which is totally unacceptable. Because the time that the PF left office, this country was on its knees in terms of most governance issues. And the expectation from the people is that whichever government would be elected to take over from the PF would hit the ground running to mend the broken things that the PF left behind. But we elect, uh, the people elected the, the new government, and uh, the new government doesn't seem to be in much hurry uh, attending to the many urgent matters that require to be addressed in this country. Ladies and gentlemen of the media, Allow me to address the third major item uh, on the agenda, which is uh, the hacking of uh, our page, our presidential Facebook page, by unknown political opponents. We experienced a hack of our page about two weeks ago, and subsequent to that, we engaged some IT people, we recovered the page, but uh, it soon occurred to us that that recovery was not complete. The hackers still had remote access to our page. And within a week after we thought we had fully recovered it, we realized that uh, the hackers again took over completely. And uh, we have engaged a lot of uh, uh, people to help us recover the page. And uh, these include IT companies as well as Facebook itself. I'm happy to announce that so far, in terms of the correspondence we have exchanged with Facebook, they appear to be in the process of restoring the page. The last time we communicated with Facebook, they were requesting for identity documents of the people who were administrators on the page. And those identity documents were emailed to them, and uh, they responded saying they are going to verify the ID documents and that they will respond. So we are hopeful that uh, in the next few days, 
that verification process will be concluded and that uh, the page will be given back to us in terms of administration. We have noted that there are a lot of uh, the hackers um, posting on our page. Um, this is probably done to discredit us, to undermine the checks and balances that we have been providing. And we are only hopeful that with the support of the people and the support of uh, stakeholders such as uh, by the Minister of Finance, Honorable um, Msokotwani, that the 2022 uh, national budget is going to be uh, uh, a PF budget with a few adjustments by the UPND. And we see that statement as a way of the UPND administration trying to escape their responsibility of being held accountable on the various promises that they made to the Zambian people and on the basis of which they were elected into office. So already right now, when you ask them why they can't do this or that, their excuse is that they are implementing the PF budget. So they want to spend another one year claiming that they are implementing another PF budget. And uh, that is a sign of lack of responsibility. President Ichirema should be responsible and face the nation and tell the nation which promises he is going to be able to deliver and which promises he is not going to be able to deliver. If he is honest with the citizens, the citizens might understand. They might understand. But if he is going to continue using excuses such, that, uh, such as we are implementing the PF budget, then we, we are not going to have much progress. So in terms of our expectations um, with regard to the uh, 2022 national budget, Obviously, most of our expectations should be outlined in the paper alternative budget, which we are going to develop and present to the media, as we have done for the past five years. Uh, and I must mention that for us, it takes us two weeks to develop the alternative budget. And the UPND have been in office for one and a half months. We don't understand why they should claim that they are going to use the PF budget. Why can they develop their own budget? One and a half months is more than enough time. If they are having challenges developing the 2022 national budget, they can always contact us and we can assist. At the end of the day, we would want to contribute to anything that will help this country grow economically. Because we are fully aware that uh, when President Hagai Nechirema succeeds, then the Zambian people at large would have succeeded, and Zambia as a nation would have succeeded too. So whatever the UPND administration feels that they don't have the necessary competence, they can always consult us, and we can assist. And when we assist, we are not going to announce to the media, because that would be a national duty. We just assist them in good faith, and we shake hands, and we end there. But the bottom line is that we should not have a government which has remained stagnant because they are not able to do certain things and yet there are people within the economy who can assist them people like ourselves so basically uh, coming to our major expectation of the 2022 budget we are fully aware that the biggest mistake that the, uh, the pf administration made in the 10 years that they managed the affairs of this country was to overemphasize charity compared to economic empowerment. They believed so much in social cash transfer compared to economic empowerment loans. When you give someone a 200 kwacha, a social cash transfer, someone who is able-bodied, next month again they will need that 200 kwacha again. And that other month they will need that 200 kwacha again. And where are you getting that money? You are getting that money from a citizen who is productive, who is tax to the treasury, isn't it? So you are putting the burden of supporting the majority of Zambians on the few Zambians who are productive in the economy. Instead of you using resources to empower more Zambians so that more Zambians can be productive and contribute to the tax pool. And for employment as well as gain for business, carrying the majority Zambians through social cash transfer. So our appeal to President Hagaenda Ichirema as well as the UPND 
administration as they develop their 20, uh, 2022 national budget is that they need to shift resources from charity towards economic empowerment. And that can only be do done by reducing social cash transfer and increasing economic empowerment loans. People want loans which they can use to start small businesses. And when you go out there in the compounds or in the villages, you ask people how much they need for them to start a business, they will tell you they want a 1,500 1, quarter, a 2,000 quarter, a 3,000 quarter, just small amounts. But when they start a business using that amount, they will be able to pay back that loan within six months to a year. And then you create a revolving fund. That money is then used to assist more Zambians. And they are paying back that money. And those people have remained um, uh, economically active. They are even able to contribute to the tax pool of the nation. So by so doing, we are developing the entire nation, as opposed to having the current situation where the majority of the people are being carried by the, major the minority of the citizens who are able to contribute to the tax pool. So that is our biggest expectation when it comes to the 2022 national budget. But please go and tell President Ichirema to stop giving excuses with regard to the 2022 national budget. We're again going to be a PF budget with a, a bit of contribution from UPND. If he is not able to develop a budget of his own, he can call on us. We've got five years experience developing alternative national the government to procure more vaccines, but don't you think procuring vaccines uh, is another thing, uh, while the uptake also could be very important, because what we have seen is that in Zambia, it's not mandatory for people to get va vaccinated, it's voluntary, so don't you think it could be right for the government to maybe make this process uh, uh, mandatory so that at least we have a bigger um, percentage of people getting vaccines, just like it is in other countries. Okay. Thank you. Maybe, maybe we may take some, if there are other questions, that uh, we can answer them quickly and allow you to go and do your news. Uh, are there other questions? Any other questions from another mid house? Maybe okay. I can just add on the 20% VAT that you have also touched on. Withholding tax? Yes, yeah, uh, for the betting. Betting withholding tax, yes. Yes, okay. yes. Okay. You have criticized uh, the UPND government, but you've not given us the alternative in terms of the percentage that maybe you feel uh, could be appropriate for uh, the tax government. Okay, so um, um, I'm going to take the questions. Let me start with the effects of the of the the loans and also uh, not involving environment in it. I think the starting point is that um, 
uh, we are trying to recover this economy. And uh, one of the issues which has taken us into where we are as a country is overborrowing. So the starting point is we cannot solve uh, an issue of debt by borrowing some more. But the, the major effect also of not going through parliament is that, first of all, uh, the, the, the UPMD administration is backtracking on a policy that we all agree. We all agree that if we are going to affect the citizens, then the citizens should agree to which loans they can take. And uh, they can only agree through their representatives in parliament. Therefore, we feel uh, by the UPND government not respecting that, then we are going back 10 years back. Because we are now going to be just where we were with the PF government. And we will never know how many more loans they will be able to contract without consulting the citizens and allowing the citizens to consent to taking up those loans. Uh, on the issue of uh, procurement of the vaccine and uptake, I think it is evident that at the current stage, the uptake is higher than the supply of the vaccines. And therefore, let's get to a point where people are no longer taking it up. But in the current scenario, all the vaccines which come in, uh, they, they run out. And uh, I know there are some people who did the first dose who, who have not yet picked the, 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 the second dose. They don't run out. We have vaccines, but it's just people who are not going there to get vaccinated. How, how do we explain those that are looking for the second dose that have not gotten it? <laughs> you, you understand? There are, there are a number of people that I know that have been chasing the second dose. Uh, I, I have uh, people also who are jumping from one clinic to the next to try and find the vaccine. So if there if they are vaccines which are there, then this also is pointing to the inefficiency in the distribution of the vaccine. And I think you had one of the comments was that we are trying to concentrate more on also trying to, to, to lead to uh, whether we should make this uh, vaccine mandatory or not. So I think at this stage, we should not reach a point of uh, mandatory uh, vaccination. Let the citizens themselves make a choice to go there. But I think we should improve the, the delivery of this uh, uh, vaccine. There are many times that people queue up for these vaccines when when they know where they are. For, for many hours, I think we should make it more and more efficient, let it be distributed in a manner that will encourage uh, the citizens to be able to take it up. Uh, the, 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 the betting tax. The betting tax uh, should not be directed at the people who are betting. The betting tax should be directed at the betting companies. Okay, because these are, these are the ones who are making the money. People are losing and they are, they are accumulating that money. Why should we punish a person who has been punished by the betting company already, by the losses which they've made? Okay? Let us target the, the, the betting taxes on the betting companies other than targeting the poor individuals who are, who are uh, already losing in the betting. And for, those who are, for the tax which are going to tax on the individuals, I think there should be a threshold in terms of which money we should start uh, taxing. Not every 200 kwacha, not every 100 kwacha which we tax. And our proposal is that uh, let us take it to above 100,000. If somebody wins 100,000 and above, then we can get uh, uh, that tax from them. Because we'll be sure that at this stage, most likely they've recovered all the money that they had put into that betting. And now they have a windfall. Unlike a scenario where you put a, a five kwacha and even out of that, the, the government wants to take uh, away. So I think that is that is our position on the part. Yes, yes Darius. Uh, to you, Mr. Tembo, um, the assets and declaration, um, assets and liability declaration by the, the president. Um, why can't you also set as an example by uh, publishing, publicly publishing the assets that you declared um, before the Electoral Commission of Zambia, unlike uh, targeting an individual, one individual out of the 16 presidential candidates that participated uh, the August uh, uh, poll. And also, uh, before taking the matter to court, have you done a search? Because I do understand that these assets and abilities uh, should also be, I think, declared 
um, for the constitutional court uh, chief register. Well, when you look at the provisions of the law on the issue of uh, asset declaration, you realize that uh, only a person who is uh, a public officer, someone who is working as a president, as a minister, or the like, is compelled by Article 93, sub Article 2, if I'm not mistaken, to actually declare assets. That is the reason why, even when we sued in the Constitutional Court, we did not uh, include the other 16 candidates, the other 15 rather candidates who stood in the last election, because the other 15 did not manage to be elected, so they did not become public officers. Only one person was elected as president of Zambia, and through that election, that person became a public officer. So that is the requirement of the law. If we had included the other presidential candidates, then obviously our lawsuit uh, could not have helped, because in as much as they aspired, in as much as they aspired to um, uh, to become president of Zambia, which is only that one person that we are interested in. Because when you look at the logic behind someone declaring their assets, the whole reasoning behind it is that uh, when you occupy public office, you are managing public financial resources. Do you understand? Yeah. So what to be sure, the money you are uh, handling, you are not pocketing some of it in your own pocket. You who are who is managing the affairs of the nation. You understand? But someone who aspired as president but did not make it, they, they are not touching any public uh, financial resources. They are not. If you ask uh, um, uh, uh, President uh, uh, Fred Membe or President Harry Karawa if they have got access to manage public financial resources, they tell you they, they don't have any access. The only person who has access to public financial resources right now is President Haka Inde Hichilam. And that is the reason why we are competing. Yes. Uh, other than that, that, search, that issue of the search is answered by uh, our answer. Because that search would do, uh, provide the people who declared uh, at the time that uh, um, uh, uh, you were standing as an ascendancy to a public office. So it does not matter the declaration you made uh, maybe 14 days earlier or maybe... When was that nomination done? About three months earlier. Yes. yes. That declaration doesn't matter. That is the reason why even the argument that is made um, um, uh, uh, by UPND supporters to say, no, that declaration was made to whatever, whatever. It doesn't carry water. Because the law requires that you make the declaration upon ascendance to public office. Because assets change, isn't it? They increase or decrease. So what your assets were three months ago at the time of nomination and what your assets are at the time that you are being sworn into office as president of Zambia will obviously be different. We cannot rely on a historical record of what your assets were. Does that make sense? I think you've not answered my first question <coughs> on the challenge that I've thrown to you. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't think there's a law that bans you from uh, publicly uh, publishing your, your, your assets. And, and therefore, how we seen uh, you and Mr. Tembo doing that because you have come out open to challenge other... So, 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 so there is no need for a person who is not a public officer like my for boasting, is it? Because there is no need for you to, to declare. So why are you declaring? Uh, who do you want to impress? <laughs> you understand? Yes. We don't want to boast. Yes. <laughs> Good morning, Mr. President. Good morning. I'm from Manga, I write for Zambia Telecom. On the debate of declaring assets, um, I, I, I have read, read so far in the law governing that particular aspect. But what I do know, it has been a tradition in Zambia that before a, a person declares his intention to run for presidency, he need to declare what he has, so that people know that this particular person may not be for him, might do this particular person. Then the, 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 the people that it's true accept those nominations, then they take that into consideration. Now, from your argument, I have a bit difficult to, to understand. Maybe you can clarify. Do we have the law which requires that a person 
if we are in that sense, up there as soon as the crisis, and if there is a block, then what guarantee do we have that that particular person may choose to 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 to, to undervalue his assets so that it, at that point of time we may get the others or some may be tempted even to overrate the assets that this is what he said and when he comes out to say that I said this particular fact. Well, I, I, I just want to emphasize here that um, remember that uh, you're asking on the legal aspects of it and yes. remember that uh, this is a matter that is currently active before the Constitutional Court. So we can comment about the principle, the principle of transparency, the principle of accountability, but uh, it wouldn't be appropriate for us to engage in a legal debate, talking about the legal merits and the merits of uh, declaration of assets, given that the same matter is before the Constitutional Court. Uh, we risk being held in contempt. You understand that? But we can talk about the principles, the general principles. I, I hope I'm making sense. Yeah. What I can encourage you to do is to closely follow the matter as it unfolds uh, in the Constitutional Court. We'll be going back to court on the 19th of this month, and uh, I would encourage you to attend that hearing so that you can hear for yourself the arguments that we are going to be making in court. Good. I, I, I do understand that I followed the matter which is before court. Mm -hmm. the, whether you are discussing the principle or legal aspect of this particular party, but it's, I'm trying to give an opinion on what someone might think this was going to be. Mm -hmm. the, the, the outcome of that particular case is to compel somebody to declare their secrets in court. Mm -hmm. If it's being discussed, then we are held in contact with whatever is being discussed. Maybe you can discuss the principles, but not necessarily the actual merits and the merits of the matter. Yeah, there, there is a thin line between freedom of expression and uh, uh, being held in contempt. So we are trying to walk that thin line. <coughs> Any other question? Yeah. That's all. No questions? Yeah. Thank you so much, uh, ladies and gentlemen of the media. We really appreciate your coming. And uh, we are hopeful that together we are going to be able to build a more prosperous Zambia. Thank you and have a good day.